Hello and welcome to Pet Talk Podcast. This is our first ever inaugural podcast here, and I'm veterinarian Dr. Karen Fling, and I'd like to introduce also my co-host, Will McCauley. Hi, I'm Dr. Will McCauley. Welcome to our inaugural pet podcast. This is a pretty exciting day, isn't it? I agree. We've been, uh, this has been in the work for a while. Um, it, it has. Mm-hmm. It has indeed. And uh, some of you may know us already. Um, we're both veterinarians in small animal practice here in the Dallas Metroplex area here in Big D. But even though we're in the heart of the city where we are here in Dallas, it's, uh, I think, pretty amazing that we don't just see dogs and cats. We see a little bit of everything. What are some of the more unusual pets you've seen, Dr. McCauley? Oh, God, everything. So we're up in uh, kind of the, the middle of Dallas, as you said, but I will see pigs and chickens, and I will see a goat if someone brings it in. Uh, yes, we've, we've had a few Had a few pet- of those come in so you'd be surprised what people bring in and that's one of the great things about being a veterinarian is you get to see everything that walks through that door you know you can always uh, offer advice and help to to pet owners and that's what we're here for i agree and it it does make it fun no day is ever boring and uh, we're here to take care of all kinds of best friends from Mm -hmm. pocket pets to dogs or cats and so uh, we're really excited to be here doing this to offer a service to pet families everywhere and offer information and news related to pet care and so as as veterinarians uh, we feel that that's a an important part of what we do to be educators and teachers basically you read my mind that's exactly it this is just another way for us to get the information out to you the pet owners um, and as the shows go on we'd like to invite you to send us any questions you have we'd love to have different topics to talk about whether it be dog cat pig chicken whatever you have um, we'd love to answer them because we really want this to be centered around your experience and that's why we uh, set this all up absolutely and so besides medical topics and health Mm -hmm. topics we're going to be talking about anything related to pet lifestyle Um, we're going to be visiting with uh, artists pet trainers Um, we're going to be featuring different products and things out Mm -hmm. there for pet owners to to use uh, for their beloved furry and feathered and scaled friends so (laughs) we're going to have a good time and another thing we're going to talk about is is news related to pets and uh, Dr. McCauley I know that's a a particular passion point for you and while we're both members of the American Veterinary Medical Association you actually have a little more active role with that group Um, Mm -hmm. tell us a little bit about what's going on with AVMA or the American Veterinary Medical Association right well the AVMA the American Veterinary Medical Association is the premier representation for veterinarians um, across the country. Um, It is a member-driven group. Uh, They can boast a very high number of active veterinarians as members, and a lot of times, a lot of the information we'll be getting is directly from their website, which you, the viewer, can access some portions of, especially the news portions. Um, I know there's been a lot of talk about different animal health issues in the uh, the news recently, and one of the best sites to go to is the AVMA because it is vetted, no pun intended, by actual vets. Right. Um, So you know you're getting the right information. Well, Uh, speaking of right information, I know there's been a lot of talk about Ebola, uh, What's the story there? Right. So I'm sure all of you in Dallas as well well as elsewhere have heard, um, Ebola has become a huge news story this year, um, for right or wrong. And so we want to kind of let everyone know the actual true information, because there's a lot of misinformation or misunderstanding about this disease out there. Um, So we kind of want to clear the air on it. Um, Well, and having the first human case of Ebola right here in our backyard, right here uh, less than a few miles from where we are today. Um, it's definitely been on everybody's mind locally here. can be extremely unsettling. Yep, so let's start with the basics. Um, so Ebola is a virus. Uh, now, most people think they know what a virus is. It's a small bug that goes in and infects you and causes disease. But that describes actually a lot of different microbes. And so a virus in and of itself is a really a collection of proteins that's not technically alive. It doesn't have metabolism. It doesn't mate. It just goes in, infects a certain kind of cell, and then makes copies of it and spreads that out. Ebola does this just like all other viruses, but it's the side effects of that cellular destruction and the inflammation that's going on that causes the really, really, really bad clinical signs we see. Now, I've heard people say that Ebola looks a lot like parvo in the dog. (laughs) That's exactly true. Yeah, some people have called it, yeah, uh, uh, human parvo, um, for, for better or worse. But yes, parvo is um, also a viral disease that causes, it works in a different way, but it causes a lot of the same clinical signs. A lot of intestinal upset, gastrointestinal problems, that sort of thing. Absolutely. Yep. And we see that um, in 
uh, in people who actually do catch Ebola. But as far as catching Ebola, that's where the big discussion is. People think that they can catch it from just about anything. But honestly, there's only three real ways to catch it. Um, one is by transference of blood or body fluids like urine, saliva, feces um, from one person to from a sick person to another. That's really the uh, method we see from someone actually in West Africa. That's the biggest uh, trans, uh, transmission path. Um, other ways to get it is by objects like needles or syringes. Um, that's what we worry about in healthcare. For, so for the people who were treating um, patient one, um, Eric Thomas Duncan in uh, here in Dallas, um, that was a big thing is making sure that there were no accidental needle sticks um, that they used on him because that is also a way to transmit it. And then the only other way to transmit it is actually by consuming one of its uh, reservoirs or host, um, which are fruit bats and non-human primates that live in Africa. So that's not something we have to worry yeah, about. Yeah, I was going to say, thank goodness we don't have a lot of those around yeah, here. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. And so if people are worried about transmission of this disease, you really have a lot of other diseases you should worry about first before this. Not to say that it's not a very serious disease if you do get it, but the chances are microscopic that anyone will be outside of the healthcare profession or outside of West Africa will be affected by this disease. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, that's good news for, for people not only in this area, but across the country Absolutely. where a few more cases have occurred as well. Mm -hmm. And I know there's a great deal of controversy as it relates to pets and mm -hmm. exposure to Ebola. How, how worried do you think we need to be about that? Really not. Um, so the, the level of worry about if a dog can catch it or a cat can catch it, um, there have been no proven um, reports of dogs or cats becoming sick with Ebola or able to spread the virus. Um, you may have heard stories about um, there was a King Charles Cavalier Spaniel um, here in Dallas that uh, nurse Nita Fan owned that was put in quarantine right. just because we didn't have the full information we wanted to make sure that we were taking the safe precautionary measures, um, but the virus was never isolated from her dog um, as it was isolated from her. Um, additionally, there, there was uh, the case over in Spain where um, authorities actually euthanized a dog that w belonged to a nurse who had been to West Africa for fear that it may harbor the Ebola virus. Really, there is honestly zero chance of you catching Ebola from your dog right. uh, or your cat. Right. Well, I know everybody was so relieved when the mayor spoke out and said, hey, we're going to protect this dog, make sure mm -hmm. this dog is well cared for, and we're going to ride through this storm. So uh, I, I really thought that was a great decision. And of course, mm -hmm. everybody locally and across the country is so relieved that this has had such a happy outcome. Absolutely. So mm -hmm. so great news uh, for, for pet owners and pets all over the place. So, Definitely. And, and uh, I don't believe there's ever been a report as far as cats go and Ebola antibody testing. Not that I've, not that I've heard of. Or, or antibody response. Antibody response to yes. it. No, not that I've heard of. Okay. And so that brings up a good point with the antibodies because some dogs will show an antibody response to it, but that just means that they may have been exposed to it. That doesn't mean that they carry it. Um, we can get into that in a later podcast, the actual sure. inflammatory uh, response that would go right. along with but that. Right, but at this point, as we understand it, there's no evidence at all that a dog or a cat can act as a vector for Ebola. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Well, great news. Absolutely. Well, and there's information about this on the AVMA website currently That's for true. pet owners. AVMA.org. I recommend all you go to uh, that site for any questions you have, um, and you can find vetted information. Great. And of course, AVMA, as you said, is an authority source where you can trust the information that you're getting there. Mm -hmm. And and as we talk about AVMA, I'd like to also mention the American Veterinary Medical Foundation, yes. uh, another arm that is a charitable arm of that organization. And mm -hmm. And uh, I am so excited about so much of the work that they're doing in that arena. And uh, there's a new program that they have that's called Partners for Healthy Pets. Mm -hmm. And uh, what's pretty exciting about this program is uh, the American Veterinary Medical Association, along with other industry leaders, are grouping together to help inform and educate pet owners about the importance of just having annual checkups done uh, for your pets. And I think the movement uh, toward this educational campaign was probably uh, spurred on by a research study that showed that nearly 20% of dogs and over 30% of cats today, as compared to five years ago, are not seeing their family veterinarian. And, uh, you know, as, as veterinarians, of course, that's that's an upsetting statistic. And, and why do you think that is? Why do you think the 
these pets aren't coming in to see the veterinarian. What do you think's behind that? You know, I don't know. There's been a lot of talk about um, the personification we've given our pets. We think, oh, I, I go see the doctor every two years. My pet can too. But think about it. You know that your pet ages faster than you do. So some, right. in some ways... People think they age uh, seven years to one year for us. Can you imagine not going to see a doctor for 15 years? Do you think that's a good right. way to go? So right. you just and, and I think as people become more bonded to their pets, like you mentioned mm-hmm. that, uh, I think a lot of pet owners think that they would know if their pet was mm-hmm. sick, that they're that connected with their dog or cat, that they would be able to tell. Mm-hmm. And uh, bottom line is the, the veterinarian has that training and that knowledge to see things that sometimes a pet owner doesn't mm-hmm. see. Absolutely. And so having that experience, it, it at least annually and in fact mm-hmm. the American Board of Feline Practitioners really recommends that cats that are in the mature age bracket mm-hmm. those cats over seven years old actually go see the family veterinarian uh, twice annually at least and and certainly if they're a medical problem sometimes more often than that exactly and it's, I, it's and it's sometimes um, you know hard to make that logical assumption that they need that but though we know that you know how your pet feels Cats especially, but dogs as well, are very, very good at hiding diseases, especially these smoldering diseases like kidney issues, liver issues, some types of inflammation. Well, Uh, and and when you think about, you know, the evolutionary process and development of pets over time i mean it's a defense mechanism to hide when they're not feeling well Mm -hmm. and so they really do cover it up and you mentioned cats i think cats are the the best hiders of disease and and can be very frustrating for us as veterinarians absolutely Uh, dogs sometimes they'll kind of point it where it hurts a little more but a cat usually will cover it up a little better than that but that's why it's so important to get in for at least a yearly checkup and like dr fling said if your cat is um older i think it's above seven to you know for sure 10 years um, Um, especially if they have issues like kidney issues that cats often do or other things, get in twice a year because it's way easier to treat that disease before it gets to a clinical level than it is once it causes this big problem. Right, and you mentioned preventative care and early detection. Uh, Some studies have shown that by treating a condition early that it's a cost savings too. Mm -hmm. And in fact, you wind up saving between two to nine times less expense by detecting it early. And so we really are able to extend lives, relieve pain and suffering, and uh, sometimes really double life expectancy depending on on the, the condition that we're, we're finding. What did they say? Ounce of uh, prevention worth a pound of cure? Absolutely. And, Definitely and, applies in vet medicine. <laughs> and my other saying is for everything you miss for not knowing, you're going to miss 10 more for not looking. Very and true. so sometimes the laboratory tests that we do and the other diagnostic measures that we use allow us to see things internally that we can't even appreciate from the outside. So um, mm. please, please, if you haven't seen your pet's doctor within the last year, uh, definitely call and make that appointment today and as uh, the Partners for Healthy Pets program will encourage you and say uh, for each pet uh, going to see the the family veterinarian annually is as is as essential as food and love. Agreed. Easy for me to say. <laughs> <laughs> so definitely make that appointment. It's it's very important. Definitely. Okay, well, another thing I'd like to talk about is something kind of fun that we did this weekend. How about that? Oh, that Uh, was a blast. Yes, this weekend, Dr. McCauley and I uh, visited the East Lake Annual Pet Fair, and we had a blast. It was was really good. All kinds of fun and activity there. And I'm going to blow the horn of Roderick Pena there, our our cameraman and uh, uh, captain of the podcast. He's uh, got quite a sound setup, camera setup here for us here today. And uh, we are so excited to be working with him. He's really a, a talented fellow. And he was there at the pet fair yesterday as Top-notch well. Top-notch work every time, Roderick. Every time. Mm-hmm. And uh, I don't know if you know about Roderick's background, but he's quite a talented guy. And he's going to be the last person to brag about himself. Mm-hmm. But he comes from a commercial background in mm-hmm. photography and has had commercial clients like Neiman Marcus and Sam's. But he's mm-hmm. uh, kind of put all of that aside to work with us here today and to focus on portraiture and largely working with pets. And in fact, uh, one of his uh, core missions is helping homeless pets. And I think he's, um, you know, quite, quite the picture of somebody who's taken a talent and used it 
to help somebody else. And so through his pictures and his portraits of the orphan pets of East Lake Pet Orphanage, he has literally helped facilitate thousands of adoptions. And so uh, he's the, the man on the other side of the camera mm -hmm. uh, helping those those pets to be seen. And If you're looking uh, to get good pet pics taken, look up Roderick Pena Photography. Is that correct? Absolutely. Okay. And right. in fact, speaking of good pet pictures, I had to bring this one. Oh, yes. Um, this is a fun picture uh, that was taken at the event, and this is kind of a family portrait. And what may be difficult to see there is, um, yes, there are my two sons and one of my daughters and my dad in this picture, but kind of wrapping us all together there is a 70-pound snake. Isn't not that amazing? A, not a feather boa, an actual boa. <laughs> <laughs> yes, the real deal. That's right. And uh, you met this snake too That's yesterday, right. didn't Winston. you? That's right, Winston. I was able to get a picture with him as well. Um, I'm going to hold that up. Yeah, that was uh, he was hard enough for me to hold up, much less <laughs> get him strung between yeah, well, six it, different people. Yeah, well, it took people. the group of us, all, all five of us, to hold that yes. snake up. But, uh, yeah, that was pretty impressive. There at the pet fair. That's one thing. If you didn't get out this year, next year, definitely come to, uh, to East Lake's pet fair. They have games they have activities they have pets available for adoption we had some fiddlers out there we had the... fiddlers we had uh we had elvis out there i think and elvis wow okay and, and another lots... sighting <laughs> another sighting mm -hmm. and lots of good food and mm -hmm. of course 70 pound snakes so absolutely that was pretty amazing mm -hmm. now um you said this was what kind of snake it's a hey, constrictor for it sure was, i believe they said an albino reticulated python Yes, mm -hmm. amazing, mm -hmm. and uh, just a beautiful, brilliant yellow color. And so Roderick was on site this weekend to take all kinds of fun pictures. I, mm -hmm. I have a feeling there are going to be a lot of Christmas cards circulating around uh, Dallas, at least, uh, know, that have mine. snakes in them. It made mine. Yep. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So lots of good fun. Mm -hmm. And uh, so uh, what else is going on in the pet world, yep. Dr. McCauley? Yep. Um, you know, so I know there's been a lot of talk um Maybe not this year so much, but in previous years um, about recalls on certain pet foods, yes. pet treats, um, specifically a lot of the uh, jerky treats coming out of China. Um, I believe that was yes. uh, not been a problem last year, but at least a couple of years ago, we had a lot of dogs come in um, showing signs of renal failure, or renal disease right. after getting these uh, treats. Um, and it seems the problem. We've seen it yeah, a lot. It seems the problem has been tamped down some, but we still need to be kind of on the alert well, and I think it's it's been tamped down somewhat, but I would like to think that maybe at least in our arena that it's it's less in our practice mm -hmm. because of, of education and, and helping people to stay away from these jerky treats. Mm -hmm. And so far to date, I don't believe that there's been any kind of agent isolated that's mm -hmm. that's the culprit for this um so you know we don't know what it is uh, mm -hmm. we do know that a lot of these uh products that chicken jerky are imported products that are somehow tainted and causing the illness problems mm -hmm. and so um you know i always say you know buy us absolutely. whenever possible absolutely and uh, of course read your labels well now one misleading thing when you do read a pet food label is sometimes you'll see a label on the the package that'll say distributed by mm -hmm. but it does not say made in so i would encourage all of our listeners and and viewers to look for the made in the usa and don't be fooled because some of these packages you look at them and you'll see an american flag there mm -hmm. um, but that flag may just be a package decoration and it may actually be an imported product that's mm -hmm. not regulated by our fda and mm -hmm. not overseen by you know our standards here right so. under the resource for that there is actually on the avma's website a list of recalled products um so if you want you know of course they probably don't have every product on there that has been recalled or deemed dangerous but if you do see one um, that you have a question about go to avma.org there is a um, spot on there to find some of the products that have been deemed as uh, potentially dangerous to your pet Right. And, uh, you know, of course, if there are questions that you have about specific products, you can feel free to email that information uh, to us here. Mm -hmm. And actually, we can have those those inquiries or uh, requests for information. Go to Jared at We Love Pets, and that's spelled G-E-R-A-D at WeLovePets.net. And uh, just like it sounds, mm -hmm. and uh, he'll certainly forward your questions along to us, whether it be about a product recall or some other topic that you're interested in hearing about. And so we really do want your questions, and we want to hear about what's on your mind and uh, talk about ways that we can promote 
promote healthy, happy lifestyles for pets and their people. Mm -hmm. So we always say it's about wags, purrs, and smiles, and that's what we're all about here. (laughs) Exactly. We need to add oinks and uh, clucks in there as well for me. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, indeed. Well, and and another thing that I think we ought to talk about today. Switching gears a bit. Go to Yes, that I'm pretty excited about is a new book that's been released that's called Catification. And uh, this is a Jackson Galaxy book uh, done along with Kate Benjamin. And I actually had the opportunity to meet Kate Benjamin recently at a wow. blog pause conference. And in fact, she sent me the early copy. So I was pretty excited to get that. But uh, this book is all about designing a happy and stylish home for you and your cat or for your cat and you. Yeah. And the and you is in parentheses like, oh, by the way, the person's yeah. kind we'll of important you in there too. as well. Yeah. <laughs> get exactly. Cats happy first. And I know you've actually had the chance to peruse this book and you like I, it. I didn't think I would, but I actually found a lot of cool things. So I do have a cat at home um, as well as a dog. Um, and there are some really cool and really not expensive at all things you can do to um, kind of enhance the environment for your cat at home. Um, there's yes, things it is to do all about environmental enrichment. Big time. You can imagine, you know, cats um, evolved on in the desert, you know, the sub-Saharan plains of Africa, and they are, in addition to being a predator species, are also a prey species, and so they need places to hide, they need places to get away from everything, um, but they also need that um, that kind of enrichment, we call it, so activity, just like you know, I'd go crazy if I sat around at home for 12 hours and didn't do anything. Your cat may do the same thing. And so a lot of these are geared towards giving them walkways to go around right. or things to get under or in, um, just like you love watching. Well, and it's interesting because Jackson Galaxy, if you watch his show on, on TV, uh, I believe it's My Cat from Hell. Is that what it's called? <laughs> I don't know. I think so. But it's a great show. And one of the things he talks about, particularly with some of the cats that have behavior issues, is they do like to have these walkways walkways or Mm -hmm. perches they like to get up high they like to climb and perch and I think I've spent years thinking about cats as a uh, a creature a lot like a person because I'm really connected to cats and I think terra firma you know down on ground level or maybe jump up on the back of the sofa but I think what Jackson has shown is that these cats really love perching they love climbing they like to climb up in the imaginary tree and and get to a high place where they can kind of look down on the vantage point of the rest of the world and that's probably one of those those tricks to avoid being eaten in the yeah. wild it's probably uh, avoiding being prey and so it's an enrichment thing it's something cats love and and I'll tell you the other place where I saw perching allowed for cats that was really an environmental enrichment tool was at the Hills Pet Nutrition Center Mm -hmm. Um, I had the pleasure of visiting their facility in Topeka Kansas um, a while back ago and just the area where their their cats that are on the feeding trials live are just amazing and in fact after visiting there I came right back to to Dallas here and created new vertical structures vertical houses for uh, the cats that stay with us to to live in because they really like that perching and climbing ability and it's it's all about environmental enrichment exactly exactly I've, I've not been um, to the hills testing facility myself but I have heard about it and I've decided if I come back after I die I want to come back as a cat at the <laughs> hills feeding center because those, those kitties are taken well care of but, hey, but oh, yes but you know if a, a multi-million dollar company like hills knows the value of making these enrichment areas to keep the cats happy and everything it for sure makes sense to have oh, it at our it, clinics and at your home. It, it definitely does. And in fact, uh, when the East Lake Cat Care Center was created, uh, that was part of our, our design plan was to really make an enriched environment. And in fact, uh, one of our rooms, our adoption room there, has a gigantic tree in it that was uh, brought in in pieces and reassembled. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's just so great to see how much these cats love that perching and climbing. Absolutely. And then you had mentioned you'd actually been doing some things differently just with patients of your after reading Catification by mm-hmm. Jackson Galaxy. Mm-hmm. So there's different ways to, uh, that even we as veterinarians can kind of adjust how we, um, for one, address your pet when it's in the room. Um, we did say that we made, or I made um, a few of the little cardboard uh, kitty houses to have for our um, our 
orphan pets we have at the, at the uh, clinic. So just a disposable hiding cubby it and a took, place to play. Exactly. And so a lot of times, you know, I, I got to thinking about it. Well, when I go into a room and your cat, uh, most people bring their cat in in a carrier. Highly recommend that. Sometimes people don't, but it's a lot easier and a lot safer and a lot more comfortable for your cat if you bring it in a carrier for us to see. But instead of pulling the cat out right away when I get in, I talk to the owner first. So I talk to you. I try to get this um, kind of a banter going because cats will pick up on that. Cats will see that, oh, my owner, this person that I trust, um, also trusts this person in this scary white coat. Um, And so maybe that will calm them down a little bit, um, kind of give them that sense of this is not a place where I need to be on guard so much. We're really here to, to help. Right. So they, they learn quickly how their owner's responding to you. And exactly. The, uh, it's not all about getting them out of that carrier. <laughs> yeah. So, Definitely. and as you speak about making the carrier a friendly place, mm-hmm. um, in, and also, as so we've just talked about, how uh, nearly 30% of cats, as compared to five years ago, are not seeing the family veterinarian. I think one of the reasons that people hesitate to go see their veterinarian is because they're worried about stressing their cat out. Mm-hmm. And so, like you mentioned, the carrier, that needs to be a place where they're happy to go it needs to have positive associations and there are a couple of ways that I think you can do that Uh, one is to give treats in the carrier uh, to leave the carrier out even when it's not time to come see the veterinarian to where the cat's used to it it's not something that comes out once a year before Mm -hmm. the dreaded veterinary visit it's not something that's brought in from the garage full of black widows and tarantulas it's something that I wouldn't want to go in there I wouldn't want to go in there either so like I say yeah make it just a place where they can go if that's going to be their best Bed, that's fantastic you know have absolutely it, if they need a place to crawl under it might as well be their carrier so that they count that as their home as their place and that's they are right. comfortable in it so feeding treats in it um, making it part of play if it's you have one that kind of opens up on both ends make a tunnel for them making where they can go in and out of it so it's all about um, the more actually the more you can do at home to get them used to it the easier and quicker your um, your visit with us will be absolutely I agree with that completely mm-hmm. and another way to make your carrier a friendlier place for your cat I I think is uh, with the use of feel away mm-hmm. and so feel away has been around for a number of years uh, what it is is a synthetic uh, pheromone type product for cats and uh, there's a little atomizer a little spritz on product and then there's also um, a little plug-in device that you can use and then most recently feel away has developed a little wipe kind of like a little mm-hmm. handy wipe that you can wipe the carrier down with and uh, yeah. you know we feel like it really does make a difference it definitely it? does I've, I've seen it myself you know we say it's um, a pheromone. It's actually a pheromone based on um, well chemicals that the cat gives off on its own. You may right. notice when your cat comes up to you, they like to rub the side of their face on your mm-hmm. arm or your face or pretty much anything. They actually have special glands in the sides of their face that um, will emit this. It's called feline facial pheromone. It's right. hard to say, but that's what <laughs> that feel away is. Yeah. <laughs> um, this is a, um, a man-made version of that, and so it's actually a calming thing for them. When they're doing that, they're marking you or their house as their territory, and so if they count this um, this place, this uh, carrier as their territory, well, that's half the battle right there. Right, mm-hmm. right. And, and there definitely is a calming effect to these pheromones and apparently the mother cat releases the a lot of these sort of pheromones in the process of nursing and Mm -hmm. so it's a a cozy making biscuits sort of feeling so everybody loves that everybody loves that who doesn't love to make biscuits (laughs) so uh, that definitely can help make the carrier a positive experience for your cat so Mm -hmm. again that just makes it easier to help care for your pets better and make it stress-free which is what it's all about purrs and smiles purrs and smiles (laughs) so very good okay well any other tips that you learned from catification? Uh, we'll bring a few out in subsequent episodes. I think okay. we'll have a lot of mileage on this book. Good, yeah. good. And I mentioned uh, meeting Kate Benjamin uh, there at the Blog Pause conference, which was uh, really a neat uh, experience. And uh, I met a lot of bloggers mm-hmm. that dealt with pet related topics. And uh, they're such a neat group of people, um, such a great avenue for education and information for the public and uh, I liked the kind of information they brought forward because I think you and I were so accustomed to thinking of things in a science sort of way and a medical sort of way and uh, they really had a lot of fun information that kind of bridged between the the pet owner and the science side of things and Kate Benjamin in particular she has a neat website that some of our listeners and viewers may want to check out and it's called House Panther H-A-U-S Panther so referring to the house panthers in each of our homes Mm -hmm. and uh, it's all about products for cats and uh, 
talking about future episodes and mm-hmm. things we'll have to bring on. Uh, probably my favorite thing that she had out there that she had brought from uh, one of the featured products of her website was a sink cat bed. And mm-hmm. so somebody has taken this sink, a porcelain sink, redesigned it to where it can be something that will sit on your coffee table or oh, wow. People sit love on that. In, in the corner of your favorite room or your cat's favorite room. And cats like to nap in sinks. They're yep. generally oval shaped. They're kind of cat shaped. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're cool. They contour to a cat's body. Cats sleep circularly or ovally, and so it, it's just a natural thing that cats like these sinks. So Those handy listeners out there who hear this, you can uh, probably make a pretty penny <laughs> making some uh, cat sink beds, I would bet. <laughs> well, yeah. that's what this person has done. They've Absolutely. developed a cat sink bed, so mm-hmm. I don't know. There may be ways that you can go to the hardware store and do the same thing, but mm-hmm. uh, I tell you what, this particular product was so high fashion, so design-wise absolutely beautiful that I want to go out and get one just to put on my coffee table <laughs> and and uh, no other reason to start conversations I, absolutely and and I can't remember who said this I want to say it was Jane Polly and she said a, a home with a cat has no need for sculpture isn't that profound true, right? so I would tend to agree or, mm-hmm. or with a dog for yeah, that matter agreed yeah one thing uh, you know kind of brought up about the bloggers um, and um, you know the uh, Kate Benjamin, the co-author of this book, um, we all kind of fit together in this group, in this community that helps you take care of, of your animal. Veterinarians, we're trained in the scientific, the medical, the very um, you know clinical aspects of it. But people like Jackson Galaxy and Kate Benjamin have really good information about husbandry issues. So things about, uh, and when I say husbandry, I mean the way to... Um, environment. Environment, exactly. How to um, make them more calm at home, ways to, to treat them in that way. Um, you know, and we kind of go, we... Uh, we support each other in that. Absolutely. Just, We're part of that bridge. That I will tip my hat to Jackson Galaxy that he probably knows a lot more than me about designing functional cat furniture. But, <laughs> you know, it's very important to remember that in terms of medical issues and, and clinical issues and diseases, your vet is the first person you want to go to, really not the, the breeders, not, um, you know, yeah, other. And they have their areas of expertise Absolutely. as well. Absolutely. Breeders know way more about the history of uh, lines and, you know, the different um uh, areas they come from and a lot of aspects of their personality Absolutely. so we all kind of fit in together um, in that way well and and where jackson does a great job working with cats and behavior issues uh, there's another individual we've been working with that i'm looking forward to having on uh, some future episodes and that's tia guest and uh, for anybody who knows tia uh, she actually has a background in uh, the motion picture arena she she came mm-hmm. from the hollywood area and uh, worked with training pets for film um, but she quickly decided that she really wanted to be working one-on-one with the the, the pet owners and uh, people that had pets that were just part of normal households, mm-hmm. not the Hollywood stars. Mm-hmm. And so uh, she really wants to create an amazing uh, product uh, that she has in development right now where it's a uh, training that's available through an online sort of resource. And so she's actually been working with Roderick Pena. We mentioned that's uh, our, our cameraman here today and operating our podcast. And so some of her work that she's done, just taking, um, you know orphaned pets you know Mm -hmm. pets from the the shelter environment and just working with them on some basic tricks and tips and training she's created just well-mannered amazing uh wonderful parts of families uh through her work so sounds uh, like a great guest to have oh wonderful guest so we're looking forward to talking to her very soon Mm -hmm. Uh, another upcoming guest uh, some people have heard of invisible fence and we have on our upcoming schedule uh to visit with the invisible fence people they have a neat product now um, that's great for for house pets uh, to keep them from shooting out the door and running off and getting into trouble. And so uh, we're going to be anxious to hear from them about this new particular barrier, you know, doorway kind Mm -hmm. of product that they have that's a little different than, you know, a shock collar type setup, a lot different. Uh, So we're excited about that and hope to be talking with them very soon. So many good things coming up on this podcast. I recommend everybody stay tuned. Absolutely. And of course, you know, there's no better information for us to cover than that 
you out there listening and watching today really want to hear. So uh, we're here for you. We want to make this a, a fun and exciting project, and uh, we're going to look forward to seeing you next time. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. So any email questions, please send them to Jared, G-E-R-A-D, at welovepets.net, and we'll go ahead and show that on our screen. Mm-hmm. Thanks so much for listening and watching. Thank you.